Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. Thank you for joining us today as we look at ways of calculating and reducing carbon footprint. I'm Hannah Lilburn, I'm part of the Knowledge Exchange team at AHDB Dairy and today I'm joined uh, by our AHDB Strategic Dairy Farmers, Michael Ball. Good morning, Mike. good afternoon, Michael. Hello. And uh, Tony Ball, uh, good afternoon, Tony. Good afternoon. From Cottonwood Farm in Derbyshire. I'm also joined by Becky Wilson from the Carbon Farm Toolkit today. Good afternoon, Becky. Hiya. And Nick Parsons, our Head of Dairy Development at AHDB Dairy. Afternoon. And Harley Sodar, our Resource Manager at HDB, who leads on agricultural footprinting. Hello. Anyone who has not joined our webinar before, I just want to cover off a little bit of housekeeping. All attendees are muted, um, so please do not try and unmute yourself. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and available on YouTube afterwards. For those listening on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button in red, and then you will get notifications about our new webinars when they come online. We will have an email address on YouTube as well. If you do want to ask questions after the meeting, someone will be in touch. This webinar is also registered for Dairy Pro Points. If you are a member, could you please provide your farm name, your postcode, and Dairy Pro number in the questions box? For those listening live, even though you are muted, there is a questions box to ask questions, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, please do ask um, as many questions as you want today. No question is a silly question. We want this to be a two-way thing, um, and we'll put your questions to Tony, Michael, and our expert speaker, Becky. So if you would like to ask a question, um, if you want to on, look on the right-hand side of your screen, there's an orange arrow which will pop out, and um, quick click the white arrow that says questions, and then type your question into the box below. I would now like to pass over to my colleague, Nick, who is going to take us through uh, and give us an update on the SDF program and um, the new KPI Express tool. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I, uh, if I can have the first slide, I'm just going to do a very quick update of the uh, strategic farms. And I will uh, just uh, then touch on the uh, KPI Express tool. So we have been developing this group and uh, network of, of farms, strategic farms since 2017. We now have uh, 18 launched, including the White, uh, White Star up in Scotland, which uh, was launched a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have another launch tonight uh, down in the uh, southwest, down in Devon, uh, for Jim Kirk's farm. That's, uh, that's this evening at seven o'clock. And uh, we have a further four to, uh, to uh, launch as we go forward, three before Christmas. So it's developing. It, it gives farmers the opportunity ordinarily, pre-COVID, to come out to farm and to uh, engage farmer to farmer learning and uh, be able to follow one of the farms of the uh, strategic network. So they identify through uh, the, the tab across the bottom of each of the features, shows that they're autumn block, spring block, or uh, all year round carvers. So uh, I would encourage you to identify a farm uh, that you can uh, relate to and, and you want to follow. And if you click to the next slide, it ties into our AHDB uh, website, where each of the farms has their own uh, web page and it uh, gives, gives you the reason to follow that farm. So the opportunity to be able to tap into what they're doing, uh, any previous uh, webinars, podcasts, and activity that they've been doing, and also to be able to measure your uh, KPIs, your key performance indicators against what the farm's doing. So each of the farms would have on their, uh, on their webpage their own key performance indicators, and uh, gives you the chance to benchmark against them, as well as uh, looking at the uh, tool to uh, compare yourself against industry. So if we just move on, then I'll just touch on the uh, KPI Express tool, which is new, and uh, gives that entry point to farmers who are not doing much or, or any benchmarking so far. It gives the opportunity to be able to uh, start to look at your own activity your own uh, productivity and uh, uh, the way that you are farming compared to our industry targets. So we set up optimal dairy systems a couple of years ago 
Uh, it's divided into those two sections, block carving and key performance indicators all, all year round. So it gives you uh, recognition to what system you're working to or, or aspiring to do. And then setting out nine KPIs, six technical KPIs and three uh, financial KPIs. And so it gives you the option to uh, be able to measure against those. Thank you. And move to the next slide. Uh, the uh, system itself allows you to uh, go into the system, register. It takes literally a minute or two to register. And then you have the opportunity to be able to uh, measure just one of those KPIs. So you can choose a KPI that you can uh, easily get the information for, a couple of data points such as uh, block carving and uh, cows and heifers carved in the first eight weeks or uh, around age at first carving. And you can compare yourself then to the industry, uh, industry figures. So if you're having trouble, by all means contact your uh, knowledge exchange manager who will try and help you through the, uh, the process of registration. But genuinely, it is a very intuitive and simple system to be able to get into. Uh, use the link there. If you are on uh, uh, on the live show, then we will uh, we will be sending out the link after the uh, after the show. And with regards to the recording itself on YouTube, if you look in the bottom uh, below the subscribe button, which Hannah's mentioned already, then there's a link in the uh, in the details below the uh, below the YouTube video. So please do go and have a look, start to compare one and then look to uh, it, it, uh, move move through those uh, KPIs to compare yourself productivity and uh, and your development of, the, of your own farm. Thank you. Thank you very much Nick. I think there's one more slide. Oh, yeah. Yes that's the kitty and uh, this is what it will look like. So you can see here cows and heifers carved for six weeks. It uh, flags this farm is, is sitting right on the border of uh, good and excellent per, uh, performance, and uh, it's something that very simply can highlight uh, can highlight where you uh, where you are against industry. What's key to this uh, system as well? That middle box that's out there is is an opportunity for you to be able to find out how to improve. If you are uh, if you're down in the uh, below or the average area, and you want to try and uh, tag into resource, then HDB are sharing within that middle box. A number of resources that should be able to help you identify ways to try and improve that uh, that system and your uh, your own performance. So please go give it a try, have a look and uh, compare. If you need some help, please make contact with us and we will uh, we will talk you through and support you in uh, in that journey of starting to uh, measure your own farms. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much, Nick. So, uh, Tony, I'd like to come to you next. Um, for the people uh, who are listening who maybe haven't been to Cuttingwood Farm, could you please tell us a bit about Cuttingwood Farm? Yes, we're farming about 750 acres, milking 500 cows through an all-year-round calving system on eight Laley robots, which we installed just five years ago now, in 2015. Um, 60% of the land is within a mile of the main farm, main dairy unit at uh, Copenwood Farm. Um, the rest of it, a couple of outlying blocks up to six miles away. Um, cropping, we grow some marginal ground. We've got about 60 acres of miscanthus for biomass, uh, about 180 acres of forage maize, uh, about 120 acres of winter wheat or arable silage mix for whole crop. and the balance is, is down to grass. Um, in addition to that, we have this year taken on an additional 330 acres, which uh, we've been busy this year, um, reinstating milking parlour, titivating buildings, and setting up an autumn block carving herd. Um, that farm is being run largely separate from the main unit, and it's being run as a contract farming operation with a former employee um, running the show down there. Um, it's uh, that's uh, that's about four miles away. That farm is so we have got the opportunity to share equipment and, and manpower as and when we get to uh, busier times of the year. So hopefully it should fit in with the existing business quite well. Brilliant, thank you, Tony and Michael. Could you please uh, just give us an update on what's been happening at Cootenwood over the last six months and, and how COVID has affected you guys? 
Uh, yes, um, we supply milk on a liquid contract down to Freshways. Um, so obviously that had a fair impact on us in the spring uh, with the milk price crashing and uh, reducing the number of A-leads we could produce. Uh, so we did uh, cut back um, production quite drastically in the spring in terms of you know, getting rid of quite a few barren cows early, uh, cutting feed back. Um, and it has just taken us really all summer to get to claw back what we've lost. Um, we also have been shut up with TB in the spring and they did a blood test in July which took another 16 cows out of the herd. Um, so we are really a bit short on numbers and also it's just taken a while to get the production you know, yield per cow back to where it was. Um, so we are, you know, sort of overall production is quite quite way below where, we, where we'd like it. Um, but now we are we have got more heifers coming in um, as well as the last couple of months and this next month or two uh, and hopefully bring us back somewhere to where it's, where we ought to be and hopefully the um, we can pick the yield up over the winter and um, get back on track again. Uh, milk price is virtually back to where it was, where it is back to where it was before Covid and then we'll get another yeah. penny a litre. Uh, so we are, we are getting back on track now but it has been a you know, certainly a tough year, certainly yeah. financially. Um, but hopefully, yeah, hopefully things will be better come the new year but uh, here's hoping. Yeah, fingers crossed. And Tony, I just want to come back to you and um, ask why you wanted to focus on carbon today. Um, I think you uh, never go, day goes by, by without the environment being uh, topical news in uh, newspapers or on television. And uh, carbon uh, carbon emissions is is going to reach us all sooner or later. And I think the sooner we start embracing it, start understanding it and what we need to do, be to get towards the end goal of zero carbon, um, the better. So uh, it's an opportunity to uh, to understand where we are in the, at the moment, put a bit of a stake in the ground and uh, work out where we need to be, uh, be heading. Yeah, great. Well, we just want to um, actually do a quick poll for those on the webinar today um, to find out uh, what you're doing and your thoughts on carbon uh, before we pass over to our speaker, Becky. We've got our first question up there and it's how many of you uh, are are you currently um doing a farm audit We'll just answer that now. We'll move on to the next one. So 41% of you say that you are, which is great. It's a great result. And um, on to the next question. Couple minutes left, couple of seconds left on the support. So that was our final question, which was Do you see auditing as a useful tool to assess performance? And hopefully I'll just get the results of that now. 66% of you say yes, that you do see it as a useful tool. Brilliant. Okay. So I just want to, um, now we have the results, I'd like to pass over to our speaker, Becky Wilson from the Carbon Farm Toolkit, as she takes us through how we calculate the carbon footprint at Cook Wood and the necessary steps needed to reduce this. Thank you, Becky. 
Thank you very much, Hannah. That's great. Um, and as I say, I will just uh, hopefully share my screen. Show screen. Um, here we go. Can we guys see that? Yes, no. <laughs> Can we now see the start of the presentation? That's better, yeah. Yay, okay, brilliant. Um, so yes, um, it's really lovely to be here um, with you today. Um, and as I say, to start having this discussion around carbon footprinting. And those are really fantastic results uh, in terms of that poll. So really, some of you guys are already doing a carbon footprint, but also those of you, um, you know, over half of you are saying that actually it's a useful thing. And I think that's really interesting what um, Tony and Michael were saying about the, you know, the, the sort of increasing attention on agriculture's environmental impact, and especially when we start talking about the livestock industry. There has been such a focus, obviously, global pandemic aside, um, but apart from that, you know, before that, if you go back to pre-COVID, there was a lot of attention um, very much on focusing on, can you guys see the presentation? Yes. Yeah, yeah we just, yeah. okay, just that's cool. I've lost, I've lost the presentation now. So this is <laughs> quite interesting, but hopefully um, I can work out how to get back to it because at the moment I can, right, hang on, oh my goodness, hang on. Uh, right, let me just grab, there we go. There we go. I can see it again now. So this is good. Um, so yes, very much focusing, uh, there has been a lot of focus on the environmental impacts of agriculture. And so anything that we can do as farmers in terms of being able to measure and manage and understand where carbon is on the farm and what we can do in terms of the practical things that we can do to reduce emissions and improve sequestration is a really, really useful thing. And I think what you were saying, um, Tony and Michael about really being able to just put that stake in the sand and being able to say, well, this is where we are now, and then use that information to really look at what we can do in the future um, is a really, really useful exercise. So who am I and why am I waffling on to you today? Well, my name's Becky and I'm project manager at the Farm Carbon Cutting Toolkit. Um, we're a farmer led organisation that was set up back in 2009, which was last time that carbon and climate um, was very much at the focus. And we were really set up because there were, at that time, back in 2009, there was a lot of attention on um, on why we should be reducing the emissions from agriculture and agriculture's environmental impact. But there was very little that was telling farmers, well, actually, how do I do it? And what are the things that I can do that will start to reduce my emissions and improve my sequestration? So that's very much why we were set up. We're a farmer-led organisation. So we have six uh, directors who are all full-time farmers. Uh, and then I do the sort of day-to-day -day, uh, running of the projects. And the real overarching aim of what we do is to really try and provide those practical tools and resources to help farmers and growers understand how to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, uh, improve their energy and their business resilience, improve soil health, and how that all flows and focuses in terms of what you're doing day to day. So if we then look about the topic that we're discussing today, and again, you know, there's quite a lot to go through today, so I'm going to whiz through it quite quickly. Um, but again, happy to answer questions afterwards uh, in, you know, on any of this in more detail. But if we're looking at the greenhouse gas emissions coming from agriculture, all of the discussions around this and the language and the way that we communicate this is all focused on carbon. We're doing carbon footprinting. It's net zero carbon all those sort of things. But actually, for us as agriculture, we're not just dealing with carbon. Carbon is only a very small percentage of our emissions. We're actually dealing with three gases. We're dealing with nitrous oxide, which is very much originated in how we manage our soils, what we do in terms of those nutrient sources that we're putting uh, into our system, so how we manage, uh, store and apply our manures, how what we do in terms of our fertilizer, in terms of sources of fertilizer, application rates and application methods, all those sort of things very much focus on nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a big deal. And what a lot of what I'll be talking to you about today is very positive, um, you know, and we'll be talking about practical ways that we can start to reduce these emissions. My one slight doomy gloomy thing that I would just like to draw your attention to is that nitrous oxide is a really big deal when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. There's been so much focus recently on methane, you know, our demon demonized ruminant animals that we've got at the moment. And as I say, there's been a lot of focus on that. Nobody's really focusing on nitrous oxide. And the deal with nitrous oxide is that for a first, first off, it's 298 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So in terms of its ability as a gas to thicken that blanket around the earth, it's much more potent. And the other slight thing to be just be aware of is the fact that 80% of nitrous oxide emissions originate within agriculture. 
So much as with some of the other things, there are opportunities that we have to, to start to you know, uh, come back on some of those statistics. We do have a real part to play in terms of reducing our impact in terms of nitrous oxide emissions. We've then got the emissions associated with methane, and that's very much coming down to how our livestock systems are managed. So the, an the emissions that our animals are producing themselves in terms of that enteric fermentation, so that ability of our ruminant animals to digest that stuff that we can't eat in terms of forage and other bits and pieces and turn it into something that we can. And obviously a byproduct of that digestion process is methane. And unlike what the uh, BBC like you to believe sometimes, 98% of that methane comes out of the front end of the cow or the sheep, not the back end. And again, there's opportunities there in terms of improving efficiency. All the things that you're trying to do anyway as a livestock farm in terms of improving the efficiency of your system will really have benefits in terms of methane. Also, what's quite often forgotten about with that side is how we manage and store and apply our manures and slurries will really have an impact on our methane as well. And then we've got carbon, which is the issue that a lot of other industries have a real headache with. I say for us within agriculture, about 5% of our emissions, total emissions, come from carbon dioxide. And that's very much associated with fuel and electricity use on the farm. So how much diesel, electricity, all those sort of things. The manufacture and production of some of the things that we use on the farm through feed and fertilizer, but also how we cultivate our soil so we can lose carbon through that act of cultivation and turning that soil over and exposing it to the atmosphere where the soil bugs and the things that live in the soil massively start reacting and respiring and doing their thing and a byproduct of that is a loss of carbon. But here we also have one of the amazing positives we have within our industry is that actually we have the ability and we're unique in that ability unless you chat forestry slightly separately we're unique in that ability to actually be able to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and hold it on our farms and we can do that through holding it within our hedgerows our trees our forestry our environmental areas and then also within our soils and this is really exciting because that actually offers a climate solution in terms of an ability for us as an industry to be able to provide a positive. And sometimes that's quite often lost in the rhetoric and the communication that goes out around agriculture. And it's something that by doing carbon footprinting and by understanding those positive things that are happening, it allows us to change the conversation. So the carbon calculator. And really, it's really important if we're looking at understanding our impact and all those sort of things. It really comes, the first part of being able to manage carbon on the farm comes by being able to measure it. And I suppose our calculator, there are lots of calculators that are out there. And as I say, from the numbers that are coming in on your poll, a load of you will have used calculators in some in some kind. There are various different ones. And certainly within the dairy the dairy sector, there's been a lot more focus uh, on carbon, carbon accounting that's come down through the milk suppliers. But our calculator has been developed by farmers for farmers, so hopefully it's quite easy to use. It's completely free for farmers to use. So once you sign up and register, you can create as many different um, many different scenarios as you like. It accounts for soil carbon sequestration. And as we'll talk about in a little while, the way that it currently does that is it requires you to have two time points where you have soil analysis results. They don't have to be next door years to each other, but there has to be two points where you've got results in terms of your soil organic matter information. And that goes into the calculator and the algorithm behind it works out what that's providing in terms of an additional carbon sequestration benefit. But we totally understand and recognize that actually for a lot of farmers, they might not have that information. So what we've been doing over the last three years is we've been working on a soil carbon project um, in partnership with Dutchie College, Rothamsted Research and Plymouth University to really try and understand a how we measure carbon but then very much pick up that information with the hundred, over 100 farms that we've been working with and allow that to populate information in the background so that we can start to answer those really important questions about what's the soil carbon benefit of doing different management practices changing our grazing patterns including different species and all that sort of thing so for those farmers that potentially don't have that information in terms of those two lots of soil test results they will be able to look at a practice based system that will sit within our within our calculator. We provide the footprint as a carbon dioxide equivalent. So that's taking those three gases, nitrous oxide, methane and carbon dioxide and converting them into a sort of common language, which is carbon dioxide equivalent. But within that, you can also see where those different greenhouse gases are coming from. So although your footprint will be record, reported as a carbon dioxide equivalent, you can understand how much of that is coming from those three different gases. We also include the new methane methodology. Um, so this is some work looking at how methane is accounted for 
for. And the idea that the current, the traditional way of accounting for methane potentially overestimates uh, the, the importance of methane because actually methane doesn't persist in the atmosphere for as long as carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide does. So again, and I'll show you how that works on the farm example that we'll have in a minute. And we launched the new version back in January, which is pre-COVID, which we've all forgotten about. So when we calculate our carbon footprint, Quite often what happens is there's a lot of um, there's a lot of attention and there's a lot of focus on the data collection side of it. Now I will hold my hands up at this point. If it, you, you know, if the choice of what to spend your day doing is to go out on farm and look at your cows or to sit in the office and collect the information that you need to put in your carbon footprint, I know what 98, 99% of you will want to do. But unfortunately, that data collection point is a you sort of necessary process that you need to go through in order to get to the really exciting bit which is actually getting your figures and then unpacking them and understanding what that means in more detail so certainly one of our things that we try and do as as calculator developers is really try and make that process as user friendly as possible because we totally accept and acknowledge the fact that it's not the most fun thing to be doing but it's that part of that process that you need to go through in terms of being able to put that line in the sand and say this is where we are now and this is where we can get to but as I say, interpreting results is really important in terms of allowing you to then say, well, what can we do with this? And the idea is that, as I say, the process of doing your carbon footprint isn't so hideous that you have to go and lie down in a darkened room for three weeks to get over it. But actually, it then allows you to say, so what? So is this good? Is this bad? Where are the areas that we have hotspots that we can look at to start to improve? And where are the things where we're already doing good things that we can take advantage of? It allows you to be more informed. As Tony and Michael said at the beginning, it gives you that baseline, but it also gives you that evidence in terms of changing management. So once you've created your initial report, well, you can then look at, well, what would be the impact of changing different parameters on the farm? And you can start to understand what that impact would be, not just on your farm profitability or on the practical um, ability to do those, but you can also start to look at the impact on your carbon. And it's really just worth sort of, you know, it's being summarized in the fact of you need to know where you are now before you decide where you want to go. And very much focusing on what Nick was saying in terms of that you know, ability to, to benchmark and look at performance against KPIs. Carbon is just another way of looking at business efficiency. You know, it allows you to identify and highlight those areas where you might be able to slightly tweak things and improve efficiency, improve your bottom line, improve your farm performance and also reduce your emissions. So those are the things to really focus on. So when we look at carbon footprinting, we end up with our carbon balance and our carbon balance put very, very simply is just those emissions. So those em greenhouse gases which are coming from those different categories. So fuels, materials, inputs, crops, livestock and waste. And then we take away the good stuff in terms of the carbon that we're holding within our trees, our hedgerows, our environmental areas, uh, anything we're holding within our soils and then any offsets that might be coming from either recycling of our waste products or any renewable energy or other things that we're doing on the farm that providing a carbon offset. And so when we're then looking at what those actions are that we might want to focus on, it's very much about reducing the emissions intensity or the sources of emissions, and then looking at the options where we can improve um, sequestration potential. So that's a quick run through of how it works. Now we've got the results. So actually what we've done is that we've footprinted um, Tony and Michael's farm at Coton Wood. So that hopefully that gives you a bit of an understanding of what it actually looks like in practice. Because again, carbon can sometimes be a bit of a woolly concept and actually can be quite difficult to contextualize, especially when we start talking about tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. It's really, really difficult to actually understand what that means. Um, so we've actually looked, as I say, and Tony and Michael have been fantastic in terms of providing me with all of their data so that we can have a real farm example to have a look at. So at this point, I'd just like to ask um, Tony and Michael, and again, feel free to be completely honest, how hideous was the process? Um, it wasn't the most user friendly, to be honest, Becky, but I think once we had a conversation about it and recognised some things that obviously count a lot higher than other things and not not to get hung up on the the little things and and focus on the the big influencing factors and it it was it made a lot more sense then yeah so certainly i think um you know one of the one of the things that we try and do with the tool is that as you know we we are sort of 
ask for quite a lot of information because what we try and do at the other end of it is really be able to pull out the impact of different management practices but you're right when you first you know and I, and I tend to when I send the data collection spreadsheet out to farmers I tend to try and caveat it with a please don't you know please don't look at it and, and just think what what the hell have you sent me because it is a, you know and you can you can attest to this I'm sure it is quite a daunting spreadsheet when you first open it with the numbers of different categories that are there but um, what did you think when you first saw the results? I'll put the results up now in terms of that headline figure. Um, but what what were you you know I sent you the sent you the report. What were your initial thoughts on it? Well, the first thing that strikes you is there's a big figure for carbon dioxide emissions. Um, but then you start getting down into it, and you, you can see the important thing is is where the big influencing factors are. And, and to me, what what surprised me a little bit is just the very high proportion that uh, livestock is contributing to the overall uh, the overall impact of the business yeah yeah and again we'll look at that in more detail as as, as we go through this next bit um so i suppose it's just like thinking it when we think about, about carbon footprinting and we start looking at the results now carbon footprinting works a little bit like an onion in the fact that it's got various different layers and as you delve down further into those layers you get to understand a little bit more detail so again you have your headline figure or your carbon balance, which is is semi interesting, um, you know, even if you're not a saddo that likes this, uh, does this all day every day uh, like I do, um, but it doesn't really tell you very much. And especially when you start looking at potentially comparing your farm either to other farms or comparing your results this year to last year or to subsequent years, that headline figure is okay. But actually, what we really want to do is start delving down into a little bit more detail. So then we can start, we can break that that headline figure down into carbon balance per hectare or per tons of product, which allows for a little bit of comparison. So we can compare between a big farm or a small farm or, or compare it in terms of the amount of what's coming out the end of it and really look at that emissions intensities. We can then look a little bit more detail in terms of those emissions and sequestration categories. And that's what Tony was just talking about, about the percentage of emissions that are coming from those broad categories in terms of fuels, materials, inputs, all those sort of things. And on the sequestration side, which allows you to identify hotspots. And you can then delve even more further into the full results to look at what each individual input line is providing for you. It's also important to remember that actually, as I just said, in terms of benchmarking, best person to do it with is yourself. Um, but as I say, you can do it with other farmers as well uh, in terms of looking at where you are. And that does allow some really interesting discussions about, well, why is your figure this and my figure this and starting to share ideas for changing management. But it's also important to remember, and this is one of the one of the complexities when we're dealing with carbon accounting within farming systems, is that we're dealing with biological systems that are dependent on the weather. So sometimes you will get increases in emissions which are almost outside of your control because they are dependent on the weather and what else gets thrown at us and the number of challenges that we have. So it's also important to take that account as well. And what we're really looking at is also not getting too hung up on that number, but very much using that as, a, as an indicator to see whether your number is getting better or potentially getting worse and really then asking the question why. So here we have the carbon balance. So this is the carbon balance of coat and wood. And if you think back to a couple of slides ago when I showed you how that works, that's basically a really, a really high level information, which is saying emissions. So everything that's being emitted from the farm in terms of fuels, materials, inputs, livestock, all those sort of things, take away sequestration, which gives you your carbon balance. So you can see on this farm, the total carbon footprint is 4,803 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. And again, just to remember that that's not all coming from carbon dioxide. The vast majority of that will be coming from methane and nitrous oxide, but we translate it all into carbon dioxide equivalent when we report it. So again, based on what I just said, that's great. But actually, it's more important to look at, well, what does that mean per hectare? And what does that mean per tonne of product? Because that's quite a big number to start with. But again, at this point, that doesn't tell us anything about the number of cows that are on the farm, the, the amount of milk that's being produced, the total acreage of the farm and all those other sort of things. So if we break it down, it's a little bit easier to understand. So that total balance, if we break it down per hectare, uh, we're now at 50, just over 15 and a half tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year. But actually, again, we're not just producing these emissions for the sake of producing these emissions. We're producing these emissions because we're producing food. And obviously on this farm, what we're producing is we're producing milk. So if we then break that down into the carbon balance per tonne of product, um, which again, isn't often how we measure it in terms of milk system. So that gives us 0 0, 0 0.89. But if we if we break it down into our carbon balance of so kilograms of carbon per litre of milk, 
you can see that this farm is producing 0.96 of a kilo per litre of milk. Now you can then say, well, is that good? Is that bad? And this comes back to one of the other issues we have with carbon and the fact that it's really, really difficult to contextualise. Um, and whereas I said, it's not eat, it's not particularly great to do lots of benchmarking, some work that's been done across, you know, across the dairy supply chain, the average carbon footprint um, per litre of milk is at about one and a quarter kilos. So you can see that Cottonwood already is, is in a better position than the average. So we can start to say, well, why, why is that happening? And what are they doing that's good, that's already good, so that we can take advantage of that? And where are the areas where they can become even better by tinkering with their system slightly? So what does that actually mean? So again, we then go from having a number which is just a nice to know with actually, well, what can I do differently? And where are those areas where you can actually save money as well as saving carbon? I'm very much focusing on doing those first, those short term quick wins. And then what are the things that you might need to look at doing over the longer term? And that tool or the carbon calculator can be used to, to plan or model those options. So this is the next column where we look at, well, actually, that headline figure in terms of those emissions, how does that break down into those broad categories? And as Tony said a minute ago, we can see here that 80 percent of the emissions on this farm are coming from the livestock sector, the livestock industry. Now, these emissions here are not just for, not just the emissions from the animals themselves, but this is also taking account how the manure um, is stored and applied, but also the emissions associated with any imported feed onto the farm to feed the cattle. So that's where that just over 4000 tonnes is coming from. You can see that fuels is about six percent. Um, you know, materials and inventory are always a very small amount of the small amount in terms of percentage crops. So that's taking account the emissions associated with annual crops that are grown on the farm. Inputs is mainly fertilizers. And you can see in that green box there how that compares to a sort of, again, average dairy farm if we were going to look at benchmarking. So you can see that um, they're doing quite well in terms of fuel use. Um, and as I say, also in terms of their input. So fertilizers compared to an average farm. But again, their proportion, therefore, is higher in terms of livestock. Becky, we just had a question come in actually about sort of how do these figures compare to other sectors or, or other countries? Cool. So in terms of other sectors, um, obviously, if you compare to um, to a sort of more arable sector, then you tend to find that 60 percent of their emissions are coming from fertilizer use and application, then about 20 percent from fuel use, about 10 percent uh, for 10 percent coming. Sorry. So you've got about 60% that's coming from fertilizer use and application from nitrogen, about 20% from field operations. So that's fuel and cultivations, about 10% from P and K, uh, you know, manures, lime use, that sort of thing, about just under 10% from sown seeds and then the small, small proportion from uh, ag chem and that sort of thing. If you look on a... Um, on a on a beef a lowland grazing system, for example, you tend to get about 70, 75% of those emissions that are coming from the livestock livestock category there. Um, again, about between eight and 10% that's coming from fuels and the majority of the rest from inputs. If we look at what those sort of big ticket items are in terms of those areas where we're getting a lot of emissions, it tends to be around diesel usage, uh, fertilizer usage and then on a livestock system a high proportion of those emissions will be coming from the animals themselves and then also how their manures are, are, are managed and are managed stored and applied is that okay great thank you no problem the other interesting thing you just said hannah and it really breaks down to actually when we start to provide those those figures globally and those can be really misleading and that's where we get a lot of the issues that we've had in terms of you know being able to compare how we produce um you know how we produce livestock products in terms of milk beef lamb all those sort of things in this country and how it's done globally and it's really really tricky um when when they're sort of dealing with those global figures to be able to really start to to look at what's happening and i know there's been work uh, that's been done looking at how our how you know how uk systems compare to those global averages and we always come across much more favorably um, so if we then just look at a few of those categories, and I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to whip through some of this. Um, very much looking at fuel use. So fuel use, as I said, tends to be about 75% is that is red diesel. Um, it's interesting uh, on this farm, and I think Tony and Michael, um, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts, but certainly in terms of the use of the robots, have you found that that's inc increased your um, electricity usage? Yes, absolutely. There was a big step change as soon as we switched the robots on. We noticed a big jump in the uh, daily electricity usage. 
yeah yeah and that as i say that's and that's you know that so it'd be interesting to see what the um what the impact's been in terms of the emissions from what you were traditionally potentially to what you are now but also being able to offset that with a, you know improved improved performance that you've got through through installing those so again it's it's about trying to balance it on both sides um and look at what's going on there and i think currently we've got you got how, what are you using contractors for currently because you can see on that pie chart there that we've got about um 13 just under 14 percent of those emissions are coming from contractors what are contractors doing for you guys they're doing a lot of the uh the contract silaging uh combining um edge cutting yeah. a certain amount of cultivation work yeah yeah so we can include that so obviously you know you can see there that um you know just under half of those emissions are coming from from diesel that's being um that's being used by by you guys but also we can model then what's going in and that again you can do that on a hectare basis or if you know how much fuel is being used so we're taking account of all of those things um but you've also got a small amount of renewable energy going on on the farm haven't you yes we've got 50 kilowatts of solar panels on the roof of the new livestock shed and is all that being used um, within the business uh, or is any of that being exported? There's very little that's being exported. Maybe on a sunny day in the middle of July, you might get some exported, but, but very, very little. So again, if you are exporting that electricity back to the grid, then obviously we can use that as an offset. So you can take that away. So on the sequestration side, we'll see in a minute, you can start to put that on. But also if you're using that energy that you're generating yourself within the business, that's also a benefit because obviously you're not using, um, you know, you're not, you're not bringing that energy in. So again, that's a benefit that we can be had on this, uh, on this tab as well. But again, lots of opportunities to look at improvements in terms of those really those really boring things that make a difference. I mean, for for dairy farms, obviously, you know, you tend to have a higher higher energy cost associated with it because you've got milk cooling and all those other sort of things. So, have you got any of those sort of um, you know energy efficient technologies within the dairy currently around sort of you know ice banks and you know variable speed vacuum pumps and all those sort of things? Um, the robots all run on variable speed vacuum pumps. Uh, we do have heat recovery units. We don't have an ice bank. Okay. We do have heat recovery from the uh, refrigeration equipment. So we are uh, recovering Super. hot water there, and setting some of the costs. Brilliant. And again, that will have a benefit in terms of a, a carbon benefit as well from doing that. If we then look at crops, um, then the, the emissions here are associated with annual crops um, that are grown on the farm. So quite often what people will say at this point is, well, where's the grass? Um, you know, and especially when we're on a sort of predominantly livestock farm where the, where the main crop that's being grown is grass. The way that we account for emissions um, within this cropping tab is it's just things that are grown annually and are removed. So you can see that just almost, you know, just over 90% of the emissions associated with crops here is coming from the maize that's grown on the farm. And a little bit, um, as Tony said, were you saying is, is it, is your wheat done for whole crop did you say at the beginning um some of the wheat goes to whole crop either that or we grow a specialist uh, arable silage mixture cool cool so again if that's on an annual system that would be within here as well um, and again this is taking account of as these crops are taken off and harvested the residues that are left within the field that breakdown of that is a source of nitrous oxide emissions so that's where that's where this figure is coming from here in terms of grass obviously the things that are going in to feed the grass in terms of any uh, manures or slurries or those sort of things or fertilizer those come in within their separate tabs and in terms of the benefits that's coming from those grasslands we'll have a look at that in a minute with sequestration in terms of inputs, you'll see that the vast majority or almost all of these inputs here are coming from uh, from fertilizer use. And this is another one of our big ticket items in terms of things that we can do to start to start to really reduce it, because fertilizer is an inherently carbon intensive product, both in terms of its production. So when we make it in the factory, but also then when we use it on the farm. Um, and what's interesting here is, um, you know, is, is that a lot of this is just coming from nitrogen. And there's a really good opportunity, um, you know, with all, within within livestock systems to really make the best use of our manures. That's a fantastic resource that we have in terms of being able to use that as a fertility as a fertility source. You know, they've got fantastic amounts of P and K in them as well as as well as some nitrogen in them as well. And actually, if we're if, you know if we're making the best use of what we've got there, it's a brilliant opportunity to reduce the amount of um, you know artificial P and K that we might be using. And what's your use like currently on the farm? Um, are you using any bag P and K? No bag B and K at all. No, it's uh, straight straight nitrogen or nitrogen with sulphur. Fantastic. Um, and again, is that sort of um, 
So when we look at ways to improve the efficiency of that sort of thing, there's things we can do in terms of coating fertilizers with inhibitors, looking at potentially putting it on more little and often and integrating it with our manure use so that we can really start to ensure that the efficiency of the nitrogen that we're putting on is really taking account of what's going on in terms of the manure and the slurry. So in terms of your manures and slurries, how are you currently, um, how are you currently managing your slurry? Um, a certain amount of it we separate and we use the separated liquid on the grassland in the summer, either after a cut of silage or we also do cut and carry so we can uh, nip in after a uh, cut and carry um, mow and then uh, put a bit on that ground. Um, a significant amount of the slurry gets ploughed under the, the maize ground as well. Um, we try and get a, a fair bit on the, the ground in the spring, uh, try and minimise the losses and, and maximise the use of fertilizer, the fertiliser value then. Brilliant, brilliant. And um, sorry, I didn't catch it if you said it. How are you applying it in terms of what machinery are you using? Sorry, we're using uh, all predominantly splash plate. Um, okay. Uh, so we again, hoping to yeah. move to a dribble. Button. Brilliant, in, in, as I say. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 good opportunities there to improve efficiency uh, in terms of actually placing the product, you know, on the ground uh, where that crop you know, crop can suck it up and use it to grow, and that will improve the efficiency of it. Um, again, we've okay, talked. Sorry, just yes. to come in again. Um, we have lots of questions coming in, um, so we probably will go a few minutes over today. I hope that's okay. But um, one relating um, to if the arable farms are measuring their carbon footprint before they sell the crop, is that carbon attributed to the primary producer or the dairy that buys the wheat or soya, or do both have to have the same carbon on their books? No. So um, what we'll get to in a minute. So that, so those crops that um, that Tony and Michael are growing here are, that are being used on the farm, they're taking account of the emissions associated with those there. But that's obviously not everything that they're using. When we get onto the livestock tab in a minute, I'll show you. So if we've got livestock farms that are um, are bringing those crops in. Um, then obviously we're taking account of the carbon cost of that within within the livestock system um, and there will be a proportion of that. So we won't, there isn't double counting going on, but obviously there's a carbon cost of that crop that's, get, that's coming onto the farm. And when we start looking at feed sourcing and inclusions of things like soya and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, it's important that we take account of the full carbon cost of producing those things that go into our feed, our feed blends, which we'll talk about in a minute. But certainly, as I say, if we, if, you know, so, so there is a, there is a benefit to growing some of these things where you can, um, you know, on farm and making use, you know, if you've got, if you've got land that you can, you know, grow some, grow some things, which reduces the amount of stuff that you have to bring in, then that's a carbon benefit to you. But we're not double counting uh, in terms of, you know, it, it being counted on the arable farm. And then it's also counted on the, on the livestock farm. We take a proportion of that that's coming off that farm, because obviously, if we weren't the end user of that, then that would potentially go somewhere else. Um, and again, when we're looking at more global products in terms of some of those, some of those things that are going in. Is that okay? Brilliant, thank you. Brilliant. So I'm conscious of time, and this is the sort of quite meaty bit that we'll look at now. So obviously livestock, we thought at the beginning in terms of that 80% um, of the emissions were coming from livestock themselves. And you can see the broad breakdown on that left-hand side, uh, left-hand side donut chart there, where you can see that seven, just over 70% of the emissions are coming from the dairy cows themselves. And if you've got a sort of the way we measure the emissions from the from the animals themselves as we look at um, you know we look at what they're producing so for a dairy cow for example we look at the the liters of milk that she's producing we look at what she's being fed and we look at what's happening to her manure in terms of whether it's produced as a solid material a liquid material and then whether it's um, applied on applied out of grass whether it's stored and applied and all those sort of things and that makes up the the sort of emissions factor that's associated with 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 a cow and then that's multiplied up by the numbers of cows so you can see here that the vast majority of those emissions are associated with the cow themselves, cow, and then the replacements and the young stock that are on the farm. Um, but then you can also see that about 18% of the emissions are associated with the feed. Um, and I don't know, Tony or Michael, whether you just wanted to um, give us a brief summary of your of your current feeding system in terms of um, in terms of how it works. Are you on a TMR system? Uh, yeah, we, we feed uh, TMR right through the year. Uh, with a mixture of mat grass and maize silage, uh, we buy in straights, uh, soya, sugar beet, distillers, uh, molasses, and pre-mix them ourselves uh, according to what they need. Uh, as Tony just said, we use cut and carry uh, in the summer for the high yielding cows, and then the, the low yielding cows uh, go out to graze in the summer, and then they get buffer fed at night. Um, so yeah, trying to make, make make the best of our own forage, but also 
obviously uh, buying straight to uh, to maximise production. Yeah. And again, you can see here from this, uh, you know, from this donut over here, you can see that obviously soya meal, which has quite a high environmental footprint on it, you can see that that's producing about, you know, just over just over five percent of the total emissions associated with livestock. And again, in, you can look at look in the full results in terms of what that's providing in terms of those tons of carbon. You know, there are potentials, and it's something that we certainly need a lot more work in in terms of trying to find viable alternatives um, to soya. Um, that have a lower carbon footprint and you know there are there are some options out there in terms of looking at rapeseed meal and those sort of things um, and it's something that will certainly improve in the future and, and I suppose you know just in terms of a, a sort of understanding if you you know if you substituted that soya meal and you changed it over to, to a sort of UK produced rapeseed meal then that that percentage would go down from you know that total livestock footprint percentage of five just under five and a half percentage and it would be down at 0.8 percent so there's a significant saving to be had but we also need to make sure that we've got you know we've got those got those products that we can use so that we can start to move away from uh, some of those more environmentally damaging products and certainly in terms of looking at how we can improve this figure um, it's very much looking at um, improved efficiency it's looking at health health management it's looking at reproductive management because if you think about it those um, our livestock when they're before they carve down and enter the milking herd actually they're producing a lot of emissions but they're not actually producing anything at the end of it because they haven't got to that point where they're actually starting to produce milk and actually be productive in the system so what we want to try and do therefore is make sure that we've got optimal health status we've got fantastic reproductive management and fertility management in terms of making sure that we've got really good calving intervals that we're making sure that our heifers are carving down at two um, so that actually that that time that they're um, they're unproductive but they're still producing emissions is minimized and we're also keeping them in the herd for a long time so that actually again that the unpro unproductive time at the beginning is offset over a longer number of lactations which they are there within the herd for. There's also some really interesting work going on with genetics at the moment in terms of making sure that we've got really um, efficient animals in that respect and we're also looking at making sure that um, we can look at it's something that we'll look at in the future is selecting for methane production because they've now worked out that methane is a heritable trait. I'm conscious of time so I'm just going to zoom through these last few bits but the other thing I said to you at the beginning um, is very much looking at the impact of this new way of measuring methane on livestock and this is this idea that methane is potentially a short-lived climate pollutant um, and so actually if we start to um, look at it therefore in a different metric so taking it from looking at its impact over 100 years to actually saying that what methane is more likely to do is that actually it has an initial pulse where it's very um, potent over after those nine to 12 years and then it breaks down into its constituent parts and is reabsorbed back into the system. There's been some work done at Oxford University which has developed a new way of measuring methane using a different, slightly different metric. And if we apply that metric, the way that we can apply that metric is if your numbers of cattle on your farm aren't increasing. So if your herd is staying at about the same number of cattle, so you're not adding any, you're not significantly growing your herd, then what that new methane metric allows us to say is that actually the amount of methane that's being emitted from your cows is balanced, therefore, from the amount of methane that's actually being broken down and reabsorbed into the system. So you're not actually adding any more methane in. And the way that we can look at that is through this new metric called GWP star. And you can see the impact of that here in terms of this is the traditional way of measuring it using the sort of looking at methane impacts over 100 over 100 years. So using GWP 100 and you can see that the emissions associated with the animals themselves here is up just over, you know, three three thousand three hundred and eighty two tons. But if we apply that different metric, you can actually cut that by about 75 percent. And you can see that the new footprint here for the livestock themselves is actually down at just under 500 tons. So it makes a massive difference. The other interesting thing to think about is that it actually allows you to concentrate your efforts in terms of the things that potentially you have slightly more control over in terms of looking at feed, because this same metric can't be applied to your feed. So when you start looking at this uh, pie chart here about the fact that 72% of those emissions are coming from the cattle, the milking cows, and 18% are coming from the feed, when you apply that new metric, it actually changes that completely. Um, and you can really start to concentrate some of the things you can do around feed. So just to finish off then, sequestration, the good bit. Um, so how do we measure it? Well, you know, we have those different areas in terms of hedgerows, woodland, field margins, which are all measured on an area basis. We have perennial crops, as, as Tony and Michael said at the beginning, they've got their miscanthus there, which is fantastic in terms of a sequestration source. But then in order to include um, soil carbon and the amount of carbon that's being sequestered in the soil as a result of management, there's that need to test. And currently, um, we didn't have those two years worth of tests that we could include um, in terms of monitoring it. So the other way of thinking about it, if we don't have those those um, 
those points um, in terms of those those data points that we can put in is saying, well, okay, we know what our total carbon balance is. What would we need to achieve in terms of an improvement in soil organic matter on an annual basis in terms of being able to offset those emissions that are coming through in the system? And then you can start to think, well, is that achievable? And so what would need to happen um, as I say, the current sequestration that we've got measured is some, as I've said, some coming from hedgerows, a little bit from, from recycling, a little bit of offset, um, some from that miscanthus, which is providing the majority of it, and then a little bit of woodland, which is mainly, I think, Tony, um, infield trees, isn't it? I think we put in for that. Uh, infield and hedgerow trees, yes. Yeah, that's, that's it, good. yeah. But then, as I say, if we looked at what the percentage is for soil carbon, so how much would we need to achieve in terms of improved soil organic matter? And we'd need to imp we'd need to achieve about a 0.25% annual increase across 152 hectares of their grassland, and about a 0.2% increase across their arable land, in order to offset all of those emissions. And then you can start to think, well, how achievable is that? And what are the opportunities that we might have in terms of being able to get that? You know, can we can we reach that far? Can we you know can we actually do that on a, consistently on a yearly basis? Or is there something that we need to start looking at as well? Because again. Steel carbon isn't our, isn't our sort of be all and end all, but it is a really useful tool in the box that we can use. And not only is it, is it providing a climate solution, but it's also improving the resilience and the performance of our, of our farm. So it's a really, really good thing to be able to do. But it's also really important to look at the opportunities to reduce emissions. So just to finish off, and then as I say, I'm happy to take questions. Um, you know, carbon calculators are a really useful tool to just look at business efficiency. Um, but as I say, it's just an alternative lens to look at it. Find one that works for you. It's an evolving science. None of them are perfect. None of them are, you know, do everything. All of them are moving in the right direction. But just because they're not perfect, it doesn't mean that we can't start the process. We have to start somewhere. We've got these really, um, you know, these really ambitious climate targets that we've got to reach. And a key part of actually looking and assessing our proximity to net zero is starting by measuring it. And that's where carbon calculators can help. So, yeah, just I'd just like to say very much thank you to Tony and Michael for um, for allowing me to, to bombard them with questions and being uh, hopefully willing guinea pigs uh, for this carbon footprinting, because hopefully it's allowed you to actually see it in a farm situation, which has been really helpful. Um, and as I say, I'm happy to answer any questions at that point. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Becky. That was very informative. We have a few questions, as I say. And um, one of those is, can you benchmark between farms? Is far, uh, can you benchmark between farms that are using different tools? So consistency is really, really important. Um, and it's something that it's something that's been quite tricky um, in the fact that there are there are publicly available specifications for carbon footprinting. There has, you know, there are sets of standards that have been have been developed. Some of the problems that we have is that some of those standards are were done quite a long time ago. So the PASS, you know, publicly available uh, specification which deals with carbon footprinting was was last updated back in 2011. And since 2011, a lot of our understanding and our knowledge around how these things work has got much better. Um, and so so yes, you know, you can you can benchmark between tools, but it's it they will be taking account of different assumptions. And so the best thing to do is to find a tool that works for you and stick to it. Um, but what we definitely need um, in terms of that sort of wider, wider policy ask is that we need um, we need some consistency. And a way of thinking about it is that, you know, I don't really mind which carbon calculator you use. Use one that works best for you. But what we need across the whole sort of carbon calculator industry is a bit like, you know, it doesn't matter which car you drive, but all cars have an MOT and they all have seatbelts. And that's what we need for sort of carbon footprinting is we need that that sort of base level of consistency that means that you can start to start to compare across tools but the, the the basic rule is choose a tool that works for you and stick to it because then when you get changes you know when you take when you do it year on year the differences you'll see you know will be down to changes in your management rather than the fact that you've just changed tool and it might be using something that's slightly different i mean i don't know tony and michael have you have you had a footprint done by you by a different tool in the past no, um, this is the first one. Okay, okay. Because quite, like quite often, um, you know, if, if I do dairy farms, they've had they've had tools done, uh, they've had carbon calculators done before as part of a milk contract or something. And so again, you know, quite often they'll come out with reports. And you know, there's there's lots of fantastic calculators out there. It's just about finding the one which works best for you. And some of that is very much looking at well, what do you want the results for? So if you want the results to to do some sort of marketing or to sort of provide some sort of narrative in terms of 
what your current position is, then it's really worth looking at, well, something that is very um, uh, validated and certified so that you can stand behind those claims. If you're looking to understand the impact of certain management practices, then it's worth looking at something that's quite in depth so that you can actually see those impacts. And again, so it's, it's what do you want the information for and then find one that works best for you. And then just ask those questions in terms of, are they being transparent um, and open in terms of how they're getting to their figures? Because we all need to be more transparent and open because what we need is to be is to be have more confidence in the figures that come out so that when you guys have been through the process of doing a carbon footprint you're then confident and happy that you can start to then use that for whatever you need rather than thinking well are these the right figures and all those sort of things and becky just another one about the tools out there and um, with so many different tools how can we assess footprint of the whole industry um uh, we are assessed as required by our milk buyer, but no sequestration is taken into account. So yeah. so many different tools how can we access for the whole industry to measure how the industry is performing really. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's something that we, we need to we need to get we need to get better at. It sort of goes along with the consistency thing uh, in terms of I think there are that you know there has been there has been uh, traditionally certain things which are are left out of some of the calculators and that's been because there's been uh, you know a lack of evidence and there's been a lack of uh, a lack of consensus in terms of the right ways to test and soil carbon sequestration is one of those in the fact that a lot of um, you know a lot of calculators either don't take account of soil carbon sequestration or if they do um, they do it on quite a limited basis and it's something that there's been a there is a lot of a lot of attention in at the moment in terms of making that better and I know there's work going on within different Different carbon, um, you know, carbon footprinting tools within the supply chain, dairy supply chain, which are looking at how to how to better take account of it. Because at the moment, what's happening is that we're being we're being penalised for all the negative stuff, and we're not we're not being rewarded for any of the positive stuff we're happening. And so, in terms of how we engage, you know, and we engage everybody in the industry, we need to be able to take account of some of those those good things that are going on. And we also need to be able to look at well, how do we how can we look at just by just, you know, we can't just have a simple thing where we say, well, just carbon sequestration is automatically happening. We need to be able to look at, well, what can we do to improve that? Um, so we will get there and there will be some sort of, uh, you know, regulation, legislation to, to provide that consistency, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah, and I'll probably just go for one final question um, and then I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Harley. And if we haven't answered all of your questions today, uh, we will get in touch and we will answer them all. Um, so this is at university, we were told that by including forage maize in the diet, it reduced the methane production. Um, how does this work? And is it a worthwhile strategy for farmers to use or adopt? Um, so that the starch so sped up rumination, I think. Yeah, yeah. So there is, there is, there has been work around that. And again, looking at um, where the energy is coming from within the diet. Um, and if we're looking specifically at methane production, then if we have um, diets that are slightly higher uh, in terms of that starch content, then they will be producing less, uh, less methane because they produce additional methane when they're digesting that forage and as I say when they're digesting grass and those sort of things it takes more energy within the rumen to actually digest that and a byproduct of that digestion is methane which comes out the front end so again if we're produce, if we're giving them feed that is actually um, you know it has has a higher higher energy content then it's less it's less effort for that rumen to be able to digest it so there's less methane produced one of the things we have to look at is looking at the sort of wider you know wider environmental uh, you know footprint of those sort of things and certainly when we look at Feed, you know, feed constituents. We look at feed sourcing and look at, you know, how we grow those. Then, yeah, that's all part of the equation. But yes, um, we also need to look at, you know, longevity and balancing those rations. So certainly there is a, there is a, there is a role to play for forage maize, but there's also lots of other exciting stuff going on with different additives and other sort of things to be able to reduce the methane. Great, thank you, Becky and um, Harley. If I can just bring you in at this stage and just could you tell us a little bit about what AHCB is doing? around um, carbon and how we are helping and supporting our farmers. Absolutely. Um, uh, thank you. Um, and, and, and Becky, thank you very much for that really good introduction to carbon footprinting there. That was, that was excellent. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time, given how much time we've already um, uh, got. But um, so a couple of points. You know, why should you care about carbon? OK, and, and from my point of view, um, the reason you should care about carbon is because it's a really good indicator of efficiency. Just really repeating stuff that Becky's already said. And what's more, it highlights opportunities for improvement. But those, you know, just doing, going through an audit and coming out with an answer, uh, 
you know, a, a result and answer, a figure, um, isn't quite enough. That's kind of a, a, a what. And we need to get to the point of why do you want to change it and how do you change it? And that's where these carbon management plans come in. And it's all about business efficiency. Um, it was really impressive to hear that 41% of you are already doing carbon audits. Now, I, I'm going to guess that the vast majority of those are because of uh, supply chain compliance. And that's another big driver as to why you should be interested in carbon, because not only is the supply chain after this information, in future, ag policy is also going to demand that you provide um, you know, this carbon information. But there's going to be a difference. The supply chain is, is often interested in carbon footprinting at an enterprise level. You know, so it's the mill. Ag policy is going to be interested on the farm basis. So we need to be able to do things at both enterprise and at farm level. Okay. And I really like that point, Becky, that the best person to compare with is yourself. You know, and you've got to, we need to get to that point where actually we understand where people are starting from. Where's the baseline such that we can demonstrate and provide evidence of improvement and progress? So um, on a, a more sort of um, a corporate line, if you like, you know, from an AHDB point of view, uh, you know, what can we do? What's going on? Um, so some of you might be aware that we're rolling out the Farm Excellence Platform Carbon Project, where we're taking 40 of our strategic farms uh, through carbon audits and then developing bespoke carbon plans for those farms such that they can be used as demonstrations to, to a much wider uh, farmer audience as to how well are those carbon management plans you know being put into practice what is the farmer experience of it does it make sense you know so uh, find your local um, uh, farm that's involved um, get involved in uh, the, those uh, discussions and groups but you know if you're not yet ready to do the audits and that, that's perfectly fine not everybody is um, you know what nick was talking about and uh, the kpis it's really, really good. And it gives you that level of comparability. Roughly, where am I? And a lot of those you know, business and financial KPIs are really good proxies uh, for carbon and the environment as well. Um, at HDB, we're also, uh, we will be producing, you know, sort of an understanding carbon, why, where, how, what, when, um, and a glossary of terms. Because for a lot of people, this is a steep learning curve. You know, I mean, uh, we, we talk about carbon a lot again like becky said but we've actually got these three different gases that we're talking about and then carbon in the air versus carbon in the soil um, so that's all in there and we'll have a host of um ke events coming up over the winter and into next year so keep your eyes peeled for that and of course those ke events you know they're your events so you can influence what you want discussed there um, and then something that sort of um not always quite so obvious because it's not quite so farmer facing is some of the work that we're actually doing um, with DEFRA. So we're actually working on um, an industry standard approach to how these calculations are done and what methodology they follow. And part of that actually is can we develop a platform that allows information you have already put into one system. So it might be your farm account system. So actually that information automatically transfers over to uh, the carbon tools so that you're not having to repeat uh, the data entry. So um, we, we sit on a, a, a DEFRA expert working group on that to sort of try and lead that work there. Um, and the, the last point I'm going to leave you with is any questions you have, feed them in. That's what we're here for. That's literally what my job is. We're here to help you. We're here to answer those questions. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you, Harley. And then I just want to finish off by coming to, to Tony and Michael again and sort of find out what changes you're going to make at Coatonwood um, going forward to, to try and reduce your, your footprint. Have you got anything in mind? I think from my point of view, I think the point that Harley's just made and that Becky made previous to that, it, it ties in with business efficiency. And I think the big wins out of this is if you're looking to improve your productivity if you're looking to improve as we are our milk and forage um, improving either increasing outputs for the same input or uh, reducing inputs for the same output I think the, the thing to take out of it is the, uh, the net gain on, on carbon emissions as well as the the financial improvements so it's 
it's continually trying to uh, improve your business. I think some of the things we've done this past uh, year or two, we're, we're growing more and more red clover in the uh, in the grass mixes now, which will uh, reduce fertilizer use and, and hopefully improve some of the protein content in the, the silage, and that'll uh, that'll start to have an impact as well. So things like that that uh, I think we just need to keep on uh, trying to improve and trying to become more efficient. Brilliant. Sounds good. And um, Becky, I just want to thank you very much for your time today. And just remind everyone that we have another webinar this evening, the launch of our um, community dairy farm in Devon. And we have um, another meeting on soils with Tim Downs uh, tomorrow. So if you go onto our events page, you'll be able to find out all of that. And for you, uh, those of you listening on YouTube, subscribe um, so you can get all the updates. And thank you very much, everyone, for your time today. And uh, have a good have a good day. Thanks.